Welcome to Ripple Effect Connection. I'm your host, Christy Hugic. Our mission is to empower you with valuable insights and actionable strategies that can truly enrich your life. I'm excited to bring you another episode of Coach's Corner. This series will open the door to a treasure trove of wisdom and practical guidance from some of the most influential coaches in their fields. Today, I am pleased to introduce you to my good friend and coworker, Ryan Spillane. Ryan works with me at the clinic for Dr. Will Cole. She is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and is also a certified personal trainer. Ryan's passion for health and fitness was ignited through a childhood immersed in competitive gymnastics. Transitioning seamlessly from athlete to coach, Ryan possesses a deep-rooted belief in the healing power of real food and functional movement. She dedicates herself to helping others understand their bodies and live pain-free lives. Ryan and I could be on various Coach's Corner episodes riffing about many health-related topics, but today we are going to talk about finding a workout routine that works for you, a hot topic always as the new year approaches. We want to help you find habits that stick and fit into your day-to-day routine. It is not a one-size-fits-all answer. We know that movement is medicine, but sometimes finding the right routine can be difficult and intimidating, but we've got you covered with all the tips you need to be successful. Here now is my Coach's Corner with Ryan Spillane. Ryan, this is a big moment. This is probably, I say this to a lot of my coaches that come on for Coach's Corner, but this is probably your first of many appearances because you and I could be on here talking about a variety of topics, but today in particular, we're uh, we're attacking the topic of fitness because we know it's January coming and many people want to dedicate more time and effort to working off the holiday goodies and the overindulgences. So while we have your attention, we're going to address the elephant in the room and talk a little bit about fitness. So let's get started with how do people begin? What is the best way do you feel for someone to sit down and come up with a workout plan that fits them? Yeah, so there are two ways kind of to approach this question. Um, The first way is probably the way most people don't wanna hear it, so I'm gonna start with that one, but it's investing in a coach. Um, I truly believe in the power of coaching, and I think the best thing you can do come January is to find someone that can work with you within the gym, within your home, you know, within a space that you feel comfortable with and work with someone one-on-one or in a group setting or virtually. There are so many different ways to get some type of coaching nowadays, but I truly believe in the power of coaching and that's usually what gets people to their goals the fastest. We're coaches, right? So we highly believe in this power of coaching. Um, And why take on a huge task that you probably aren't qualified to do? I always talk with um, clients or just general population people about this. It's like we're a world of DIYers, I feel like. Everyone wants to just do it themselves, and I totally get that. I love doing things myself too. But when it comes to like working on your body and not only working on your body but working on your health, you only get one, right? You only get one body. So why try to do it in your own hands, in your own terms, when you're not qualified to do that? We, you know, when we get injured, we don't try to surgically, you know, fix ourselves, although some people do, which might not (laughs) work well. Um, Or like think about when your car breaks, you don't, some people will try to do it DIY themselves, but sometimes it doesn't work properly. Why do that when it comes to your own body, right? And I feel like there's a lot of um, anxiety around going to the gym and making sure you're doing it right and Um, you know, people have a lot of pressure on themselves to look a certain way or be a certain way. So why put all that pressure on you when you're trying to make a huge life change? Put it on someone else, right? Put it on a coach to have and help you and guide you through um, to make it easier and more optimized, um, a more optimized process. Um, And that's usually what I think holds people the most accountable to is having someone who knows what they're doing to walk you through that whole practice. Um, so just to come full circle, I think just hiring a coach, working with someone is the main priority. Um, if it's not your main priority and you do want to DIY it, 
there's the second part of the question, right? This is where like people want to know, all right, give me the the formula, right, of how to get into a workout plan. But I personally think uh, like constantly varied movements, which I know we talk a lot about of just doing a plethora of different movements or utilizing different modalities or doing a, you know, you know, resistance training um, type of workout or going for a walk or doing Pilates or uh, participating in some type of sport, right? Like these are all things that are going to help you and your body um, accomplish the main goal, which is to get healthy. Um, I rather see a variety of different tools and practices be implemented than just doing the same thing over and over again. Um, so from a general, and that's why having a coach too kind of goes full circle to my original question. It's complicated. It's a complicated process. And why put that on yourself to kind of come up with even someone like me who I, I'm, a, you know, knowledgeable in this, um, and know how to make a workout plan. Even someone like me, I'm like, I want someone else to tell me what to do. I don't want to tell myself what to do. We don't hold ourselves accountable usually to that extent. So let someone else do it. But if you can see your workout plan as a constantly varied, multiple faceted, and then utilizing the entire body. So not just uh, pinpointing one muscle group or one activity and doing it, you know, as a whole body approach and mind. We talk about that a lot in our coaching, right, that we do. Um, there's this whole mind-body connection that's really important. So not only should you be working out your muscles, but you should be working out really the biggest muscle, which is your brain, right? So doing that too in conjunction with what we're doing in the gym, I think is hugely important for accomplishing your goals. Yeah. And I think like what you touched on is perfect for the trainer is going to help you come up with, you know, how many days a week can you work out? Because, you know, you need to know some of these things before you go into the proper type of workout. You need to know what the goals are. The other thing is that a coach sees things that you don't. And yeah. so, you know, I know for me, everyone was like, why would you go to a trainer when you are a personal trainer. And yeah. I'm like, well, A, I need to take something off my plate and I don't want to spend the time thinking about how I'm going to work out. So, you know, that was the the person I learned from. I went to and he was training me when things got really hectic and, you know, when I got diagnosed with autoimmune, I wanted someone to do a workout just so you can see how special you can get. You I wanted someone to design a workout that was going to not help me with the brain body connection because the exercises were a little bit different because I had MS, right? So push-ups on a foam roller while I'm holding on to the foam roller, um, just gripping a pull-up bar. Like there are, so you can get so specific for you and that is really hard to know and you need another set of eyes on you. So that's why I think it benefits people to do that. Um, we kind of touched on number two, which is the importance of the trainer in yeah. this in this role but how do you suggest people find out like what i was kind of referring to the right exercise for their body that makes a difference not the one that's in the book or on the internet that's the hottest workout or on tiktok but the one that's right for their body yeah exercise selection is really individualized um it should be individualized at least most people who think of like conventional movement patterns or exercise practices or just going to the gym it's like oh you just you know grab some weights you just do these things right you run on the treadmill you do some sit-ups and that's that's it um but at least in my um experience of working as a personal trainer and working with clients, it needs to be as individualized and personalized as possible, especially when you're talking about injury prevention. Um, so every single person that I ever worked with will do a very specific movement evaluation. There are tons of different evaluations out there. There are ones that you can do um, that are on the general you know, web that you can find. But I use a um, movement pattern assessment from a company called Active Life. They're a local company by me um, that really specialize in exercise movement and injury prevention, kind of more of a CrossFit lens, too. They did have a um, affiliate with CrossFit at one time. I don't think they do anymore. They're more so into this like 
um, functional movement pattern uh, world now, um, which CrossFit definitely has its place in functional movement. But, um, you know, it's it's a population that some people want to be opt into or not. So they wanted to kind of like broaden their horizon of the population that they want to work with. And mainly they want to work with coaches and people who are trying to recover from pain without stopping the gym. Um, and that I really resonate with. And I know that's a question that you're going to ask in um, a couple of questions from now, but like injury prevention is, you know, definitely near and dear to my heart. So that's why I implement this movement assessment. And it basically goes over the major joints within your body to see how mobile those joints are. And based off of how mobile your joints are, will dictate what movements you should be able to do depending on your results. So it tests, you know, your ankle flexibility, your knee flexibility, your hip flexibility, your back, um, your upper back, your shoulders, your elbows, your wrists, really all the major joints within the body. And then based off of where each of my clients land on the specific evaluation gives me as the coach like, okay, they can touch their toes. I can give them a deadlift and load it. If someone can't touch their toes, why the heck would I give them a deadlift to utilize um, as a modality? That's just going to cause an injury. An injury. So having this movement assessment, and this is something that um, it's free. You can look at this um, there if you Google or YouTube like Active Life Movement Assessment. Um, they have a video on there. I like for my clients. I have like a questionnaire that they can use with the video, so it's a little bit easier to like track but you can just use the video you do need someone to help you with some of the movements for an example one of them is like bringing your knee to your chest and it's hard to do on yourself um, so having someone else do it for you is going to be really helpful but basically based off of those movements and where you score on the test will decide all right are you flexible enough to do this movement is there um compensation happening um are we able to load this movement? Like you might be able to do a squat, but can we add load to it? Yes or no? Like there's these very specific questions that I ask myself to make sure that you're gonna get the best um, quality movement patterns to get you to your goals and without uh, the process of injuring yourself in any way. Um, so I can't you know, speak enough about injury prevention. Um, for all populations, right? Not even just for like uh, general population or older populations, but even athletes, right? Like making sure that you're staying healthy so that you can progress in your sport. Like this is just one of those tools um, that everyone can utilize. And then it's great as a way to reassess too. Um, you start it off like when I work with a client, I will that's the first thing I do with them. And then we will repeat it a couple of times throughout our time together just to see if things change, you know, things are changing all the time um, or if that injury or that um, compensated area is improving or not improving. Um, so it's just a really good check in for the coach and for the client to make sure that they're taking care of their bodies in the right way. Yeah. And I think that's what my generation was missing. So you know, like injury prevention, that wasn't really a thing. No one was looking up and down the kinetic chain either. They were just addressing, you know, pretty much each injury. So that's what, as a NASM, you know, certified personal trainer, I mean, people didn't understand how you could tell so much yeah. from just an overhead squat, like me watching. I used to have people send me the videos and I'm like, you have to shoot it in the right way. And then, you know, we can look at that. We can tell so much just by that. And there are some trainers out there. I had a horror story when I was learning to become a trainer where I was watching this trainer train someone at the gym who had 45 pound weights on the squat rack on each side. And I'm watching the knee valgus come and I'm watching the knees bow in and it's scary. Yeah. And so, you know, there are exercises that you need to do to strengthen that. And so I know when she moved over to another trainer in that gym, that was the first thing they started doing was because they saw this imbalance. Yeah. So it can, you know, this is not to scare anyone away from doing these things, but what it is, is, is get some guidance. And if you yeah. are trying to play a sport, 
you know, it's so important. And I know, like I said, for me, that's what I wish I had more of when I was playing sports was like, okay, you know, well, you know us, we're always asking why, right? It was like, well, why do I keep having a knee issue? And like, I, I'm convinced that females have ACL issues because of the shape of the hips and how the pressure, how the woman's body is kind of a little more rounded like that and kind of bows in at the knee. And I was like, I swear that that has something to do with why women have so many ACL injuries. And well, so, but we didn't know that stuff. You come from a basketball background, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. Basketball and soccer. Those were the yeah. two sports those I played. Like the two sports that are probably the most taxing on your right. lower knee, especially your knees. That right. I was listening to a podcast recently and they said like there's signs out there that if you played basketball, the percentage of you having an ACL or MCL injury is like skyrocketed. Just yeah. Because of, like the short like bursts of movements from side mm -hmm. to side and most people aren't taking the knowledge that we know from exercise science and applying it in a um, practical way to help injury prevention. And like you said, from older generations, it was like, just work until you can't work no more. And it's we're right. starting to understand that that is really almost the complete opposite of what we want to do. It's more so work smart, not hard mentality now. And that there are very specific ways that you can um, leverage fitness and resistance training to prevent injury and promote recovery and promote performance really. Yeah. And we're going to touch more on that, but I want to, I want to get back to the goal setting quick because I, I just know that that's, that's one of the challenges that people have the most that I've seen before is that they come to you. And again, you know, this is not a ad for a personal trainer, but I just think if you're not used to this stuff and you're starting new, this can really help you is a personal trainer is going to ask you what your goals are. And what will happen is sometimes people on their own will set these unrealistic goals and then they get frustrated when they, they don't happen. And then three weeks into a workout program, they're like, I can't do this anymore. One example I would give is someone joins a gym that's 30 minutes away from their house and they realize that three weeks in, 30 minutes each way and the workout, that's a lot and they can't do it. So you have to know yourself. So what's your best advice when someone's sitting down right now listening to this and they're saying, that I wanna make my goals for 2024. What are, the, what are the best ways that they can set effective goals? I think the biggest thing, and we see this a lot being coaches in our space is um, people always bite off more than they can chew, right? They really try to change everything all at once instead of changing just one thing. So the biggest thing I would recommend is just starting small um, so that you can be more successful in the end. Um, you know, if you're if you come January, and this is usually the January mindset, right? Or January mentality, it's like, all right, life changing, all, you know, altering the whole lifestyle completely. We're going to the gym five days a week. We're, you know, not drinking alcohol anymore. We're going to change our diet. We're going to go from a standard American diet to, you know, a paleo diet. And they do all of these huge lifestyle changes, which, is great, right? Their heart is in the right place, but doing all of that at once is so overwhelming and so um, time consuming and you will set yourself up for failure if you take on way too much. So I always say start with one goal and one of those major goals, right? So if it's fitness, um, you know, and even some people will say, okay, my goal is fitness and I'm just focusing on fitness but I'm gonna go to the gym seven days a week for two hours a day. It's like, okay, yes, your goal is hyper-focus on fitness, but now let's make it even smaller than that, right? Like you don't have to go to the gym and I actually would highly encourage you not to go to the gym seven days a week for two hours a day, right? Like let's start even smaller. Can we just go for a walk for one day, right? Or do some stretching or like body weight exercises at home. And just do that once a week. And then next week, try to do it twice or go to the gym twice or go for two walks or double the amount of reps that you did from the first time you did it to the second time you did it at home, right? And then build off of that so that you eventually get to a place of um, more volume because most people, our minds think we can handle more than we actually can um, in the beginning at, at least. 
And the goal isn't to get super sore. Like, I think that's also a misconception that I hear, especially when people first start off in the gym. It's like, if you're not sore, you're not making gains. And it's like, no, especially in the beginning, if you're if you're sore and, and if you're too sore, you're almost doing a disservice because you're breaking down the body more than it can quickly recover. And that's what, um, that's what, you know, building muscle and going to the gym is all about is kind of slowly breaking down the body. And then the process of making it stronger is giving it time and space to build up again. So you have to give your body a proper amount of recovery time in order for that rebuild to happen. If you don't get that rebuild, you're just constantly breaking down. And then if you're constantly breaking down, that's where overtraining comes in, that's where injuries come in, and that's where your goals are gonna stop, right? Like if you get an injury, then your goal of fitness or working out consistently is over. You're not gonna be able to do that until you rehab that specific injury or get through that specific pain point. So I always say start super small, smaller than you think you need, right? and um and work your way up from there and then the other thing that kind of goes really well hand in hand with this is um just your mindset i feel like people have this very um insane mindset with with lifestyle changes um and be practical of of how your timeline of your um, goal process should, should happen. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, working with a professional or a personal trainer can really come into play. Um, but you, I always hear this, I'm sure you hear this too, Christy. It's like, oh, I have a wedding in six weeks. I need to lose 10 pounds or (laughs) I got vacation next month. I want to look good in my bikini. And it's like, you're setting yourself up for failure by just starting in such a small time frame and having this mindset that you're just going to like crash diet or crash exercise for the next six weeks and literally burn yourself into the ground to just get to this goal. And that's, you know, again, setting yourself up for failure. I truly believe crash diets don't work. Um, They're actually super dangerous for your body um, and can do really the quite the opposite of what you want. It can ruin your metabolism. It can cause injuries. You know, the list goes on. So I always say give yourself the time to actually devote to accomplishing this goal. And the bare minimum, I would say, is three months. It takes at least 90 days to build a habit. So that should be the bare minimum of time that you should allot for something like a lifestyle change or habit change. Ideally, an entire year, so 12 months, would be the best thing. And this way, you're, it gives yourself some grace, right? If you have, um, you know, a wedding to go to, you don't have to not eat at the wedding or enjoy the foods that are there. Or if you have, you know, your friends are getting together on a Friday night and you're like, oh, I can't, I got to go sweat my butt off for an hour and a half. It's like, no, you don't have to be as strict or rigid when you have a longer time frame to get to that goal. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I always talk about with folks is, you know, if you're starting new and you mentioned it like the volume, but I I do, there's value in just mastering the art of showing up because I think too, what happens, right? True. What happens is someone will come in and say, okay, so I can work out 30 minutes a day for six days a week. Okay. But then what happens if there's one day where you don't have 30 minutes? Do you not work out? So like, I know for me, one of the things I had to learn when with all the travel is there are days that go haywire and I have a choice I can make when I'm traveling and I'm on the road and I'm covering an event and, you know, I cover a sport that happens outside. And when there's weather, there's different curveballs that get thrown. And so at the end of the day, I have to decide what's the most valuable for me. Should I sleep extra? going to dinner with friends because there's that connection and time that to just wind down or working out because usually you can't do all of them. So I always pick the one I think is going to work for me. But the other thing I've learned is that there are 15 minute workouts. There are five minute stretches. I just want to show up and do something to try to move my body that day. And it doesn't have to move the same way every day. And there's such a value in rest. You hit on that, right? I didn't learn that either early. You know, I just wanted to work out hard all the time. And I know you and I have learned the hard way that, you know, sometimes we need rest. And what people also don't understand is when you rest, after you've been working out like this for a while, when you do get some rest, you actually do make gains 
the week that you rest. So yeah. most of these trainers are going to go in four week intervals with kind of what you're doing. And you're going to go through, like Ryan said, I agree, three months, you know, you're going to see a periodization that your, your coach is going to do where you're going to likely do some similar things for four weeks, but then you're going to change it up because your body likes curveballs. Um, yeah. And that's, that's how you make gains. It's not doing the same thing over and over. So yeah. I'm going to kind of direct my next question to a certain part of the population. And I don't want those people to get mad at me but I always see this with runners. So I'm going to single them out. <laughs> they just want to run. Okay. Yeah. And so we touched a little bit on this with injury runners get injured a lot. And I don't know if you do the same thing, but when I see people running on, I'm right by the West orange trail here by my house, which is a beautiful spot. And I see people running and I think to myself, Oh my God, how are they going to run on that? just so many imbalances in their gait. I hope they're doing other things to help, right? So yeah. the importance of cross training in order to continue to do something you love like runners, how can we get people to implement this in yeah. their regimen? I think it's hard when you hyper focus on a very specific sport like that cuz that's that is sports, right? When you're when you're practicing or involved in a sport that is constant volume on the same muscle groups happening over and over. Um, so, and that's why you single out. And I said that too, like basketball players, you single them out with knee injuries and runners, you single them out with like ankle injuries and lower body extremity injuries. Um, I think the biggest thing is, and when you're in a professional sport, I'm sure your coaches will be doing this, but from like a general population standpoint, because they're not going to see what these like professional runners are doing. They're not just running, right? They are doing cross training. They're doing all different types of modalities. And um, we talk about this, Christy, in the clinic we work for all the time. But like I explain this in the realm of um, when you're eating, right? You hear people say the more variety of fruits and vegetables that you can get, the healthier you're going to be. That same thought process will happen when you're thinking of any type of exercise modalities that you're going to use. The more varied your exercise um, routine is, the healthier you're going to be. Because if you just squatted all the time and you just focus on lower body, you're going to have major compensations, not only in other areas of the lower body, but also in, you know, other areas of your body as a whole. Like if you're neglecting a major part of your muscle group, like your upper extremities or your core, or your back, you're going to have compensation. You're going to be more susceptible to injury. So, you know, one thing that I always recommend is and we've kind of already touched on this, but just like having a whole body approach to um, exercise and warming up properly, recovering properly, hitting all muscle groups, um, hitting all different types of modalities, whether it's um, resistance training or weightlifting, whether it's cardio, whether it's um, like stretching of any kind, balance training, you know, there's a time and a place for all of these things and you can't just pick one modality and stick to that. And that's really why I love CrossFit um, because that's their methodology. Their methodology is constantly varied, uh, performed at variety of different intensities, um, at different volumes and different loads over an extended period of time. And that's, you know, really why my heart is set on CrossFit. Now, do I think a lot of CrossFit affiliates take that and forget that mentality? Yes. I think, you know, that's where overtraining comes into play too, because a lot of CrossFit workouts are like drill your body into the ground. <laughs> and that I don't agree with either. And and that's where, you know, as an athlete or as a person, you have to be your biggest advocate. Um, and I know Chrissy and I have battled with being our biggest advocates for really prioritizing our health and not only our, you know, external health, but our internal health and specifically our minds and our like central nervous system. People forget that when you're exercising, all of these other things are being influenced and you really need to listen to what your body is saying when you are performing and exercising um, to make sure that all things are synergistically working together and not one one thing is is happening more than the other. So if you can do a, a variety of different movement patterns, I think you'd be really, you know, well off. And that's going to be really helpful in preventing injuries as a whole. 
Yeah. And we've, there's so many tools out there now too, yeah. right? So, I mean, I feel like I have every tool my chiropractor has in their office at my house. I have yeah. a hypervolt. I have an electric stim. Um, I have, you know, Not cupping. I can do my own cupping, you yeah. know? So there's a lot. So like when you all are watching like things like the Olympics and you're seeing Michael Phelps and you've see these big welts that you you see like the, these are cupping that's that's yeah. things he has to do because he's doing a repetitive exercise yeah. over and over but he needs to do this and pliability is a thing i used to hate stretching i still no. do i still no. don't like it it's but boring. it's boring but it's pliability painful. is important and if i know one of the biggest athletes that because people respond to the athletes that have done this. The, that's why Tom Brady had the career he had. Because of the pliability is the reason why he didn't get injured often in playing a sport like football. So uh, I'm a Dolphins fan. It's hard for me to single out a Patriots quarterback. But I can tell you that that guy did a lot of things right. And now he has a, a center that has people doing his exercises that he was doing. He's not lifting big heavy weights. He's yeah. doing banded exercises in a lot of situations. So... Yeah. I think that if my, my best advice to someone is if you love something and even me, I love the Peloton, but that is if I'm sitting at my desk all day and then I'm going to sit on the Peloton, those are not conducive to each other. You have to give your hip flexors a break. So our theory as trainers is always, we want to stretch what's tight, but strengthen what's weak because usually they're the opposite muscle group. So, you know, I think I think that's one of the big things people can do. So let's just say Ryan that someone gets injured. Okay? So now they've got an injury. How do we treat and handle that injury if someone does get injured? Yeah, it's it's, it's going to depend on the injury, the severity of that injury, you know, what caused the injury. Um, but one thing that really drives me nuts about people getting injured is this idea of once you get injured, it's like, oh, okay, I'm just not going to move. I'm going to take all this time to rest it, which, yes, there's a time and a place for rest um, and, you know, icing and heating and um, applying pressure and, you know, lifting the injury up um, for blood flow. And I love all of those things. But acutely you can rest but long term it doesn't mean oh I threw my back out and now I'm just not I'm going to be sedentary for the next year and a half because I'm nervous about hurting my back again um, one of the worst things you could do for an injury is not do anything at all um, because your body's not going to heal completely on its own yes the body has this innate intelligence to heal um, internally, yes, but when it comes to injuries, you do need to uh, really structure in a, a recovery plan. And the recovery plan doesn't mean just sit on your butt and wait for it to go away, right? It's it's doing active things. This is why we have physical therapists, right? Like when we have injuries um, and you're re recovering or rehabbing an injury, you go to a physical therapist and they give you very structured movement patterns. Um, to rebuild and re-strengthen those areas. Another thing that I um, like to touch on when I talk about injuries is, and it don't have to be like major, like I broke my leg injury. It could be like, oh, I moved the wrong way and I have this nagging shoulder pain. Um, most of the time when you have a localized pain, that's not always where the injury is taking place. And I like to describe this with the shoulder in particular or the knee. I like the knee too, um, because there are a lot of different things going around those objects. So if you hurt your shoulder, what's around your shoulder? You got your trap muscles, your back muscles, your scap muscles, you know, you got tons of different muscles surrounding that area. And it could be something compensated. It might not even be an injury. Like you said, Christy, if something's tight, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's injured, but you need to release that tightness and it could cause localized pain in, a, in somewhere else. I like doing the example of your knee because you could, a lot of people have knee pain. Um, and so like if you have pain in your knee, doesn't mean that your knee's broken, right? But maybe think of the major muscles we use quite often is your quads, your hamstrings, and your calves. So if you're constantly walking or running or squatting or climbing or really we do we use our legs all the time, that could be putting strain on one muscle group, pulling your knee in one direction. And then if your calf muscle is really tight, it's pulling your knee in another direction. And now you have this localized pain in your knee, but it 
has nothing to do with your knee, right? Like if you were working on your knee to try to alleviate that pain, you're not going to alleviate the pain because that's not where the pain is stimulated from. It's stimulated from your quad muscle, your hamstring muscle, or your calf muscle. So I think that's a huge misconception that people have and why working with a professional on this is so important um, to really just, again, fine tune this and streamline it so that we get out of pain as fast as we can. 100%. 100%. I give I can give an example. I had a sore when I was uh, teaching classes. I was getting a super sore right calf. And I was like, what in the world is going on? And I was stretching it and I was foam rolling it. And I was like, something's not right. Like, I, yeah. I just had this thought in my head that this is like referred pain because of something else. It was my SI joint, which is yeah. a lot further up the chain and I had to go to therapy for the SI joint to yeah. fix the calf and the SI joint can sometimes affect the knee too. Yeah. And so, you know, that again, that's the thing. You mentioned the mobility part. I so agree with that. And back in the old days, again, I'm old, Ryan, so luckily you're not growing up in a time where some of the you know, the ways that we did things are cryptic and it's it was still, you know, state of the art for the time. But I think doctors learned really quickly. Some When I had my torn ACL, I actually was able to play, that's a long story, but I was able to play basketball for a year with a torn ACL, with, yeah. a, bra- with a brace. I believe it. The only reason I was able to do that, I think, is because my hamstrings and quads were so soccer. strong from playing yeah. soccer because I was a soccer player. I was able to do that. Of course, eventually that didn't work out. Other things, you know, got torn while I was doing that. Okay, yeah. wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but I don't have any regrets because I played my senior year. So when I had to have the surgery, there was a lot going on in the meniscus on top of the ACL. Yeah. Back then, it was mobilizing the knee for like six weeks in a straight leg brace. And now they do the opposite. They're like- Now it's the opposite. You surgery, you're like up and going. And I think it caused a lot of issues for me that I never felt 100% until I got scoped about two weeks into the season in my senior year of college. And I was like, just go in and fix this because so people know, little small thing. But if you take the meniscus out, because sometimes blood doesn't flow to all parts of the meniscus. So people watching on video will see this. This is your meniscus. The blood doesn't get to all of it. So if you have a tear where the blood doesn't get to, they don't fix it, they take it out, which is great for recovery because you can recover like that. But it's terrible for long term because you're taking out the buffer between your two bones. So when they started doing that and then I come right back and I can play, then I felt 100% finally, okay? But then you see now later in life, what you deal with is the osteoarthritis from that. And so, you know, I'm fortunate I'm not complaining because, you know, I'm able to manage it and still do a lot of things. But the bottom line is the the days of recovering with the mobilization and things like that are out. And so as soon as you can move it, you move it. And every doctor I've ever had knows right away, even when I got in a car accident and hurt my neck, my doctor wanted me to do exercises. We started exercises really early in the process with this. That's That neck brace did not stay on for long because I've always responded well to the body moving. And I think that's what the world is kind of figuring out now is that it's not good to just baby it when you do have. Now, that being said, don't go run three miles if you're, yeah. you know, yeah, you have to be smart. Right. But sitting on the couch and having it immobilized the whole time is not necessarily the best thing. Well, even back in the day, I'm not saying back in the day, your time, but Ryan's young, just so everyone knows. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Like you're saying, like they you had a meniscus tear, immediate surgery. Now you really shouldn't be getting surgery on it unless you have all three MCL, ACL and meniscus tears. You should be able to live. And I've worked with clients who have a meniscus tear or uh, ACL tear, MCL tear that don't need surgery that have gotten 100% pain-free just from a very specific um, uh, personalized workout routine utilizing resistance band, utilizing, you know, very, uh, I love doing like um, holding movements, like holding the bottom of a squat, um, like static movement patterns. Um, Resistance bands are huge, uh, building up the, the, uh, quads, like you said, the hamstrings, the glute muscles for specifically for knee pain, right? And for knee issues. Mm -hmm. 
um, people can uh, really get out of having this major invasive surgery now just by really rebuilding from the inside out with a with someone who knows what they're talking about. Yeah, hundred percent. And like, I'm at the point now where, I mean, I see a great orthopedic surgeon. We don't want to go in there for anything. Yeah. We actually know I have another couple of meniscus tears in that bad knee. Yeah. So here I am. I have osteoarthritis, just to give people hope. I have osteoarthritis. I have two tears that are in that knee. I have a tear in the other knee in the meniscus from when I slipped on a wet floor at the gym uh, yeah. teaching but I don't feel those things because I'm doing, you know, what Ryan said, you know, I'm doing the right exercises and making sure that they're, they're, um, you know, that they're taken care of. And it, it is maintenance just like everything in health, but it is maintenance, but you, you can do that and you don't have to have surgery. It doesn't have to be the first answer for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to circle back to going to the gym now because we've hit the injury bug quite a bit, but let's circle back to folks going to the gym. So there's going to be people listening to this that just, we see it all the time. They just don't have the confidence yeah. to necessarily want to go in the gym and be be working out. Um, you know, the the old Gold's Gym <laughs> uh, images are what people sometimes have with the gym. There's going to be these burly young men in there lifting heavy weights, and you know, especially if you're female, you know, sometimes. And and look, I'm not going to single it out because there are males that deal with imposter syndrome too. But yeah. if you're one of those people that just isn't feeling the confidence, how can someone get that confidence to kind of go into the gym and, and do these kinds of things? It's going to go right back to my first answer to your question is hiring a coach is the top tier, right? Like there are ways that you can work around hiring a coach too, but um, hiring a coach, I think is one of the best things, right? Like go to the person who knows what they're doing, right? Go to the the top of the food chain and say, hey, teach me what you know. And that's really what the mindset of a coach should be. Um, I should never be high or I should never work with someone and say, all right, this is someone I'm working with for the rest of my life. They're going to come with me and, you know, I'm going to have them as a client forever. That's not my goal. My goal as a coach is to teach you how to do these things on your own so that you can have confidence going into the gym and feeling um, comfortable with performing movements and knowing you're doing it the right way and knowing you're not going to hurt yourself. And really, I mean, for me in, in my practice, I really try to bridge the gap between things you're doing in the gym and how closely rela related they are to the things you're doing outside of the gym so that you're not only having confidence in the gym, but now you're having confidence outside of the gym too because you're moving in a safe and um, a specific way that's going to help you reach your goals faster. Um, now, with that being said, we keep saying this isn't a podcast to, uh, you know, uh, advocate for hiring a coach. Yes, it is. But in that same conversation, there are so many ways that you can hire a coach that fits your um, personality, fits your budget, fits what you're looking to accomplish, um, fits your goals. So yes, there's hiring a coach, a one-on-one -on -one coach at a gym. There's going to a group fitness class, which coming from someone who, which Chris, you might re resonate with this, but coming from someone who's very knowledgeable in coaching and fitness and sports and moving the body, right? Like I was competitive gymnast for 18 plus years, like I know how to move. I know how to get my body fit, right? But I love group classes. I used to hate them. Amen. I used to think I hated them mm -hmm. um, because I know what I'm doing and I don't need someone to tell me what to do. But I've learned to um, dimmer that mindset and go to a, a group class and you have someone who's teaching you what to do and watching you and making sure you're doing it the right way. You can bring a friend. Like if you have that, I'm nervous to go to the gym and what people are going to think of me and what to do, like bring a friend and, and you can bring a friend to a group class. You can bring a friend to a one-on-one -on -one training class. You can bring a friend to just going to a corporate gym. Um, it makes it more fun. You'll probably spend more time in the gym when you have a friend because you'll be talking in between sets, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, but I think bringing a friend, uh, to help you and stay accountable with is huge and can really help with that imposter syndrome. Um, another thing is we underestimate the power of the internet now, right? Like you guys might've been screwed back in the day, but now that <laughs> we have internet and Instagram and TikTok even, and you know, there is, you know, you have to kind of do your research to make sure you're looking at the right stuff because, some coaches, like there are so many coaches out there. And there's some really good coaches. 
And there are also some really bad coaches and not so good coaches. So you do have to kind of do a little bit of research if you choose this like lower tier um, option, which is like looking things up online and utilizing videos, YouTube videos, Instagram videos, TikToks. Um, you got to make sure that you're looking at the right stuff. Um, but watching videos and, and most people, there are going to be coaches that are going to like give you like verbal cues during those videos to say, Hey, make sure you don't have knee valgus and your knee doesn't cave in when you squat, like make sure you're screwing your feet in and that your knees are tracking over your shoelaces as you squat down, or make sure you don't feel this when you're doing a push press. Like, you know, there are these different verbal cues too, that you can look up from, different coaching platforms, um, or even just Googling them. You know, there's a lot of really great reputable sources out there. Squat University is one I really like too. Um, Active Life, I said, is a good one. Dr. Kelly Sturette is one of my favorites. Um, he's a, a PT and really knowledgeable um, in uh, and injury prevention and movement quality. Um, there are tons of other ones too. I've had tons of stuff on my Instagram for like proper movement mechanics and things like that. Um, and then the other thing is like start at home, right? Like there are programs out there that you can start a fitness program at home and get comfortable with the movements in your home and then move it into the gym, right? Um, there's something motivating about doing it at the gym. So start off with the home and and go in front of a mirror. I think that's a big one too, is just like watching yourself. Yeah. 100%. Um, recording yourself even and rewatching it or sending it to someone like Christy and I to say, hey, what does this look like? This is okay. Um, can make a huge difference to build up your confidence to be able to go into the gym on your own. Yeah. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I love all of that because I agree with that. And again, it's knowing yourself, knowing what's going to resonate with you, knowing what's right for you. I'm going to hit on the older generation again now because there'll be some older generation folks listening to this. I think Sometimes, and I, I talked about this with Randy Myers, who's one of the best trainers on the planet. You know, he trains professional golfers and works at Sea Island, which is, you know, one of the biggest resorts or best resorts in the world. And one of the things we were talking about is the importance of resistance training later in life. And I think that the tendency as we get older, we we don't want to pick up a weight. Um, but loading your joints is actually what you need for bone density and health. So yeah. I know you're going to concur with this, but we also... I think we're going to tell them something else too. And that's eat some protein. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, resistance training, I think people th think like, oh, it's going and look lifting weights. Right. But it can be so much more than that. Like resistance training can be body weight, right. It doesn't have to be weights. It can be resistance bands, right. There are so many different ways to modify progress or regress resistance training in a way that is appropriate for you. Even just like Christy, you said earlier, um, for your fitness training, like doing push-ups on a different surface, right? Like changing the balance or the environment that you're practicing something on. So for an example, like the BOSU balls or like the big yoga balls, the blow up ones, like just mm -hmm. sitting on that and doing bicep curls is going to affect your muscles in a completely different way than sitting on a bench and doing bicep curls. Um, so resistance training can look very different from person to person. There's so many ways that you can modify it if you need to. Um, but it's the, it's the golden standard, right, for movement and for injury prevention, especially as we age. It's going to help improve muscle strength and muscle tone. It's going to help with preventing arthritis, osteoporosis, osteopenia, um, any type of bone density loss. It's going to help prevent that. It's going to improve metabolism. It's going to help with weight management, um, which slowly starts to slow as we age. So more of a reason to opt into something like that. Strengthens mental health and mental clarity. You know, it's going to help you think better and focus better. It's great for blood circulation. It's great for lowering all different types of, you know, diseases, heart disease, strokes, uh, diabetes, you know, those are the main things that are plaguing our country right now. So um, they and they say you don't have to do a lot of it to get the benefits of this. They say 30 minutes, like three to five times a week at moderate intensity is all you need to do. And that could look like all the things we've talked about today, going for a walk, doing a 15 minute like workout in your hotel room, doing a resistance program at the gym, riding your bike, right? Like going swimming, like 
playing with your kids, dancing, right? It doesn't have to look very specific to what general exercise routines look like. I think the biggest thing is that you en- you're enjoying yourself and you're doing it in a way that's going to be realistic for you. And then bringing into the part of protein, like, so especially for women and especially for our older populations, I mean, this goes for anyone, not just those populations, but protein are the building blocks of our life, right? They're the building blocks of everything from the cells that are in our body to our muscles, our tissues, our organs, right? Everything is made up of proteins. Um, So making sure that we're prioritizing that macronutrient is, again, gold standard key into injury prevention and being able to fuel your body in the right way to actually exercise, right? So we always say um, we recommend 30 grams of protein per meal, um, which is about 100 grams of protein per day, roughly. There are tons of other math equations out there that you could find that, you know, there are so many. Um, At the clinic we work for, we typically say uh, 0.54 to 82 grams of ideal body weight. So ideal is that key word there. Um, If you're, you know, 100 pounds overweight, you wouldn't want to do your weight, you wouldn't want to convert that protein to that weight. You want to figure out what your ideal or your most optimal body weight is. So you'd want to subtract that 100 pounds and use that weight to get the exact uh, amount of protein that you should be eating per day. So if your if your ideal body weight is like 150 pounds, um, that would be anywhere between 81 to 100, 123 grams of protein per day. So. It's a great target. And we know how important it is. And just it got this rep at some point that you didn't need as much. I mean, that's not what we know from what we do um, yep. at all. So I, I know that as as with anything, you can find the contrary to whatever we're saying out there. But I, I can tell you from personal experience, I don't see that in myself. We don't see that at the clinic that we work for. And we it's I just every research or person I respect is telling me to eat more protein as I get older and make sure that I continue that protein. So when folks are working out at whatever age, older, or younger, let's talk about one of the most neglected body parts and how important it is to work that. Yeah, I have two that I go back and forth on for this question. So First, I think glutes. And I think now it's so funny that I say glutes because I feel like, I mean, mean, at least the younger population will say, oh, it's so trendy to work out your butt and have this big butt nowadays. And that's not what I mean by working out your glutes, right? Like I'm thinking of it from a strengthening practical injury prevention standpoint is working out your glute muscles. And the older population is like, I didn't even know I had muscles in my butt. What do you mean? (laughs) So there's like these two weird uh, paradigms here that we see. But, you know, there are three muscles that make up your glute muscles. And and as much as the younger population is trying to strengthen this this muscle, um, they're usually missing um, a major part of this um, muscle growth. Um, or ability to build this muscle in the proper way um, because your your glute is made up of three muscles, your gluteus maximus, your gluteus medius, and your, glute- your gluteus minimus. And anytime that you're doing a glute strengthening uh, exercise or workout, most people are just hitting that gluteus maximus muscle, right? When you're thinking of like squatting, deadlifting, hip thrusting, um, like climbing or uh, lunging in any way like those are usually hitting just that big muscle of of your of your glute muscle um it's trickier to get to those smaller ones like glute med and glute min so finding ways to strengthen that which is like resistance band it's static yeah. holds it's getting out of the frontal plane and getting into all the other planes of motion to really get to the deep tissue rebuilding um, and that's what's going to help prevent you know, lots of different injuries, mostly the lower body injuries. Um, And I've seen such tremendous success with helping knee injuries and hip injuries and back injuries when you're strengthening your glute muscles. So that would be my number one. The second one would probably be your your, um, abs. So um, your abdominal cavity, your abdominal muscles, those are your center, right? Your center of gravity, the center of your body. It's what stabilizes everything in your body. Um, and this is really going to help 
with injury prevention and help with every movement pattern you do. You have to engage your core to do really every type of exercise movement possible. So when you have an underdeveloped core, you're more susceptible to injuries, specifically back injuries. So I that's, you know, another thing that plagues our country too is back injuries. Um, I think it's like the third leading cause of people um, leaving work and like not and um, being sedentary is a back injury. So uh, even more important to prioritize the abdominal cavity. And if you can do like if it was the most perfect world, I'd say do both, right? Strengthen your core and strengthen your glutes. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. And I think maybe maybe explain to them what the core is, because I, I think they just think it's abs sometimes. So just explain what the entire core encompasses. Yeah, your core is, I mean, you, I, people are probably mind blown that the glute is three muscles. The core is like a lot, so many muscles. I don't even know all of them. But your core is, you know, you have muscles that are like your your standard front of your core, right? You have your obliques that are going to help stabilize your trunk and like sideways movements. You have um, core muscles that are, are going to stimulate it fr- from your back, right? You have like your psoads, which are like your low, lower portions of your core. Um, you have core muscles that you can't even see or touch or get to, right? So there are a ton of different layers of the core. And that's why really developing the core muscles are super important. And honestly, they go beyond just doing sit-ups or doing crunches. And honestly, I would, those are like the two movements that I hate for building the core muscle. Um, Again, varied movements is great, of course, with building anything. But I think one of the safest uh, core movements that anyone can do is a plank. Right. So especially for lower back pain, which, again, we know so many people struggle with lower back pain. Anytime you're curving your back, like when you think of doing a sit up or crunch and you're curving your back, if you have a weak core, you're not going to use your core muscles at all to get to that position. You're going to actually use your lower back muscles. And that's what's going to stimulate pain in your lower back. So when you're doing a plank and your back is actually completely flat, so this is when you're either on your hands or on your elbows and you're in like a push-up position, um, so your feet are behind you, your back is in a nice, stable, neutral, flat position. So you're forced to only contract your core muscles, which will be the best way to strengthen your core. Now, there are ways that you can um, not perform this the right way and you know, if your butt's sticking up in the air in the plank, that's not helping anything. If you, if your back starts to fault and your back looks like this, that's putting all pressure on your lower back, right? So you want to stay in like a nice horizontal position to make sure that you're strengthening your core the right way and not prevent or not causing any injury in anywhere else. So that's where having a coach again, watching you to make We're sure back you're to that. The right Have a coach. Way. <laughs> just going back to, you know, yeah. Starting back where we started off um, or doing it in a mirror too to make sure and just checking to make sure your position looks good. Um, Most of the time you would feel it, right? If you're doing it the wrong way, you'd be like, oh, something's starting to bother me. So anytime that happens, you would just want to come down and reset. I think one of the, you know, biggest thing to work on is strengthening your core and starting off with just a plank is probably one of the best movements you can do. This is going to be the last question. So this is a big one. People coming out of that gate, bla- guns are blazing in January. What are you going to tell them to maintain their pace and not burn out? I know we kind of touched on a couple of things for people with that, but we want to leave them with a some parting words of wisdom there real quick about just don't get burned out. Don't start like a house on fire and be that person that is no longer a part of the parking lot in the gym in Feb- in February because in January you can't find a spot. What's your last piece of advice for those folks? I would say, again, starting small, pick one thing at a time, stick with that one thing for an extended period of time. I would say three you know, months at the bare minimum, create a strong why, like, why are you creating this goal, right? Is it just because you want to look good in the summertime? Or is it because you want to be able to, um, uh, like get down on your hands and knees with your kids and play with them on the ground? Or, you know, you have this really awesome trip planned to Europe, and you're going to be walking 10,000 plus miles or 10,000 steps 
per day, 10,000 miles would be a lot. That'd be a lot. 10,000 steps is manageable. So you have these like lofty goals that are um, geared towards a very specific strong why, right? And if it's surface level goals, you're less likely to obtain them. But if it's like, this is my dream, this is my heart and soul goals, and I'm going to write it out and put it everywhere and speak it to the universe and tell all my friends and family that this is the goal I'm trying to achieve, you are going to be way more likely to achieve it. Trust the process, right? It's, it is going to be a journey. It is going to be a process. So when you're in the trenches of getting there and you're going to feel like, oh, I'm not moving the needle as fast as I wanted to, or is this even working? You do need to trust the process. You need, you need to understand that these things do take time. There's no such thing as a weight loss pill or a, a goal that's going to get to you faster than just con- time and consistency um, with that staying consistent, right? And doing the hard work, uh, even on the days that feel really challenging, um, but giving yourself grace. And that's why I think having a longer term time frame on this, you're, you can allow yourself to have grace on those days, like get out of that perfectionism mindset. Because any time that we have this perfect view and it doesn't go the right way, most people are going to throw in the towel and we want to build resilience in that. So get out of that perfectionism mindset and build that resilience internally and then be ready to course correct, right? Like if one thing doesn't work, that doesn't mean nothing's going to work for you, right? If uh, CrossFit wasn't it for you, let's go try something else, right? If uh, eating a certain way isn't isn't for you, eating paleo isn't great for you, then let's try another way, right? There's so many different ways that we can change things up and fit your lifestyle and your wants and your needs and your goals. Yeah, 100%. And um, yeah, just don't give in, but don't give in and just understand that something is better than nothing. So if you yeah. can't get to the gym and you can do some body weight exercises at home, that's okay. Like be okay with it. It's like Ryan said, get rid of that perfection mindset. Now, this has been an awesome hour to talk to you about this. How can people, <laughs> I know we could go, we could, <laughs> I, I feel like we could talk even more about it, but we gave them a lot to chew on there. And I know you'll be back on another podcast and we'll be peeling the onion back on a layers of the onion back on another topic too. So how can people reach out to you and connect with you? And I will link like things that you mentioned in the podcast. I'll make sure we have all those on the show notes list. But how can people reach out to you and connect? Yeah, my best place to connect with me is probably Instagram. That's where I, I'm mostly on is the Instagram platform. So um, my handle is optimally underscore fit. So that's um, my Instagram platform. Um, if anyone wants to take a look at my TikTok, I have some funny videos on there. I'm not as active on TikTok, but that one's r- at Ryan Spillane. Um, and then if anyone wants to find out ways how they can work with me, they can email me at optimallyfit14 at, do- at gmail.com. Yes, awesome. So I hope people will reach out and connect and good luck to everyone out there. But Ryan, thanks for sharing your knowledge with the listeners. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited for the next one. That's a wrap for this Coach's Corner episode of Ripple Effect Connection. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on building a successful fitness routine. Now that you've been inspired, my call to action for you, take a moment to reflect on the insights and wisdom shared. Hopefully you understand more about how to create a fitness routine that works for you. I'm always up for talking about my experience in the area of fitness or anything else. I'm really loving your feedback and the conversations on social media. So feel free to connect with me that way and let me know what resonated with you. You can always reach out on Instagram at Whole Health Christy. You can also get the full show notes for this episode and all on my website, christyhugic.com slash podcast. Next, spread the inspiration, like, follow, and if you can take the time to leave a review, it helps get the message out to more people. You can always share this podcast with those who you think may benefit from this information. Stay tuned for the next episode of Ripple Effect Connection. Let's create waves of change together.